we're going to switch gears now um, and move to talks about the research areas that uh, we've been exploring at Foresight over the last year. Um, so the first session is going to be on what uh, we're thinking of as uh, application layer networking. And I'll just set, uh, set up the stage and then hand over to uh, the students and postdocs who were pursuing the work. Like I said, I think um, this work would be, you know, it's in progress very much. So, you know, I uh, appreciate feedback. And it's something that we're planning on executing on for the next uh, year or two. So, OK, so application networking, uh, essentially the overarching goal for the area is to essentially build software infrastructure for modern cloud applications that provides SLAs and is highly efficient. So I talk about like why that is not there today and what we want to uh, investigate there. So the overarching context is that uh, cloud applications are a different beast. And we saw that in Sudipta's um, kind of talk as well. We're seeing pictures where you know, your applications are really distributed all across the infrastructure, which is distinct from what we used to see. You know, you've got a monolith running on like a really fat BTV database running or some other service. Uh, so think of that as you know your kind of Amazon retail or eBay, and then you know what we do today is run lots and lots of replicas to be able to scale and run them in the cloud there. And you can see that like this has happened now. It's like you know these uh, application maps. It says like each of the dots here is a microservice, and the uh, arrows are which service is talking to which service. So you get a communication graph that is very very rich and very very dense. So this is essentially the network between your application microservices that's happening today there. Um, now, so the interesting thing is there, uh, as we transition from the world on the left to the world on the right, uh, everything that was a very simple function call uh, becomes like an RPC going over the network, uh, which is exactly why when you see papers of like, you know, um, folks studying databases, like 95%, at least in general purpose, uh, data centers, 95% of essentially traffic belongs to kind of RPCs going across these applications in there. Uh, now, as you might imagine, like when things go on the network, a lot changes. Your failure mode changes, your uh, performance characteristics change, your security characteristics change, and so forth. So what's been building up on the side is like a whole ecosystem and infra software infrastructure to enable, essentially, we've disaggregated the application, and now your RPCs come in, and now we need this control back in some way. So you need service discovery, where is the replica I want to talk to? You need access control, can this service talk to this other service or not? When called by this user? You need load balancing, you need observability, you need encryption, and you know, fault tolerance and all this stuff. So all these needs that did not exist before are suddenly there. And folks are building these things, and which is why I think if you've heard of service meshes, and that's essentially the software ecosystem that is supporting the application networks that exist today. And surveys essentially show this is the way to build cloud applications, and over 90% of the enterprises are using one or these kind of different kind of service meshes in there. So that's, that's the need there for me. All right, so all of this is great. Uh, now, uh, the dark side begins now. <laughs> like, so what's wrong and why we want to kind of investigate this space? Um, I think this is Kelsey's, um, you recently retired from Google, he's a distinguished engineer who was there, and I kind of summed it up on um, the platform called Twitter, now called X. Uh, so service mesh is, you know, uh, the result of spending more compute resources than your actual business logic, dynamically generating and distributing proxy configs and TLS certificates in there. And the reason, by the way, this is happening, so this is essentially some, sums up the problem really well, but if you dig deeper, what's really is basically this is how we are building things. Um, you've got two services belonging to, you know, it's the same application or different applications. Your packets go down the stack, hit the IP layer, there they get intercepted into this blue box called the sidecar, this uber flexible thing that can do anything to your RPC traffic because it's for software that is running in user space. So packets go up the stack, then you know you do whatever you want to do, encrypt it, compress it, I don't know, add, add headers, delete headers, and then it goes across the network and then it goes kind of takes the uh, other path there. You know. So quickly, like, you know, when I kind of come to understand like what this is like, this was a very disappointing picture actually for me personally. I think. Like when I was at, um, Microsoft Research, I spent at least like five or six or maybe 10 years essentially optimizing the infrastructure. <clears throat> and the application people come along and they actually add more fat <laughs> to the end-to-end -end processing that infrastructure people like me have been able to take out on there. So this is, this is where if your performance sucks, blame the application people, not the infrastructure people. So that's kind of lesson in there. Um, and I, I see Dave nodding, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, we've we got to do something. 
uh, in the end, we all experience applications and our users experience applications. Um, so just kind of quantify the problem. That was just a graph. I think we did a study on you know how bad is it, and you know what we learned was really it is as bad as bad as you think it is. And what this is showing is that once you introduce a sidecar, the light purple uh, line is uh, with the sidecar, and your latency doubles and your CPU use uh, doubles as well compared to not using the sidecar at all. There. While I'm kind of motivating this stuff uh, using performance, it is when it comes to uh, the infrastructure we build to kind of enable application networks, it's not just about um, performance. Uh, what we do today in terms of just abstractions for these things, your abstractions are very middle boxy. So what the specification we get from the developer who wants to run a service mesh or put any kind of control over your application is, hey, here, take this piece of code, configure it this way, and put it in front of this other piece of code, and, put, and run it here, and so forth. That's all you get. So the abstraction operates on you know, either a standard HTTP or IP or TCP layer, and there's nothing much you can do with it, essentially, but to run it exactly the way your user or the developer specified it to be. So in the end, like, you know, this abstraction is all wrong. It's not talking about RPCs. It's actually not talking about fields in the application that you care about, and so forth. They're also wrong in the sense because there's a whole bunch of programmability today in the network, in the kernel, in the smart link, and so forth. Once you're given a specification like that, there's not much you can do with it. You just have to run it. So I think if you think about like optimizing away that sidecar fat that I showed with existing abstractions, that will not go very well uh, because you don't have any semantics with these actions. The final thing that comes in, I think this is fundamental to the cloud. Underlying infrastructure is shared, right? So you run these things. So the other issue is that if you run things like that, it's very, very difficult to guarantee any sort of SLAs to the network. Uh, so these types of things, I think we're kind of thinking about in this project, and I think uh, we'll see three talks um, on these very topics. What are the abstractions we should be thinking about building these? Um, what essentially are networks operating at RPC layer, not layer three like IP? Uh, how can we utilize um, hardware programmability uh, seamlessly when it's available? And how can we think about guaranteeing SLAs uh, once we get the right abstractions uh, in place? Uh, with that, I'm going to hand off to uh, Shang Feng. Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Xiang Feng. I'm, uh, I'm a graduate student here at the Foresight Center. And today I will talk to you about uh, application defined networking, which is a new abstraction uh, of building application networks. And uh, before I start, I just want to mention uh, this is a joint work uh, with folks at Duke University. So let's first look at uh, you know, the key differences uh, between uh, what we know as traditional infrastructure network and the application networks. So first, uh, application networks uh, need rich uh, message processing, not just uh, what provided by the layered, uh, traditional layered uh, network. Second, uh, it aims to connect endpoints of a single uh, distributed application, not just everyone in the whole world. And finally, uh, it is built by application developers, uh, not network engineers. So the expectation around uh, testing, debugging, and uh, how you upgrade them is very different. So the goal of my talk is to argue why the current approach is not ideal and introduce you to the, uh, a new way of building it. So just a quick recap on the uh, existing you know, service mesh architecture and it is built on the general network abstractions. And uh, it is good for flexibility, but it comes with some significant downsides. Uh, Ratu just showed you uh, it comes with high overheads in terms of throughput, latency, and CPU usage. And it also has a problem in terms of non-portability. It is extremely hard uh, to offload things to kernel, either kernel or hardware, because of the computation uh, each layer makes. And finally, it is very difficult to use. So you will be an expert in all these now uh, protocols and layers to use it. And the API is, you know, is complex and uh, constantly evolving. So with that in mind, uh, let me introduce you uh, to our approach of building it, uh, which we call it application-defined networks, uh, or ADNs. 
So we imagine the network should provide no abstraction by default, except a virtual link. And the developer, uh, instead of dealing with low-level uh, data units like packets, they really should specify the network uh, to what it should do on a very high level. And it should focus on application-relevant abstractions and uh, will provide an abstraction that is easy to write and portable. So with, that, with the abstraction, So with the specification, uh, we have we will have a compiler and a controller that auto auto generates and optimize an application specific implementation of the network. So uh, first, it will determine what process happens and how, and that includes uh, both kernel and hardware offloads. And based on the functionalities required, uh, it will also determine things like message headers and message protocols. So the primary goal of uh, application-defined networks is to meet application-specific needs without the burden of implementation at all. Before I dive in uh, to the technical details, let me uh, just give you an example uh, to give you a taste on what it looks like. So uh, the developers, we imagine the developers will write uh, RPC processing uh, as ADM programs written in ADM languages. And the compiler will take the specification and generate a, a target a optimized code on target platforms. For example, a kernel uh, switches and RPC libraries or a separate user space proxy like Envoy. And collectively, uh, they, they are what we call ADM processors. So based on the full specification, uh, the ADN will uh, stitch them correctly. For example, uh, if S1 is compressing messages, then S1 better decompress it. And we can do various type of optimizations. For example, uh, we can move uh, the fault injection to the front because uh, this avoids uh, processing of the messages that are eventually going to be dropped. Or we can uh, parallelize execute uh, the uh, elements because uh, they, they touch on different fields and we know it's correct to do so. Or we can move uh, something to the server side because it has more spare uh, resources. Finally, uh, we might be able to uh, move things, uh, for example, to smart nicks or switches uh, because they, are, uh, they have some resource to process the message and they are more energy efficient. And this is just one example. The bigger point is, uh, given the specification, uh, ADM will generate optimized uh, an application-specific network uh, based on a single application. OK, uh, with the example in mind, uh, let's look at the programming abstraction of ADM. So drawing inspiration uh, from the click work, uh, we view the RPC processing as a, a graph of elements. And each of these elements uh, performs a single network function on the RPCs. So uh, within the element, uh, we need some language uh, for user to define how what processing uh, happens. So the first idea come to mind was to use a data flow SQL like a DSL. And because uh, RPC, if you screen at it, RPC processing looks a lot like stream processing. Uh, but after surveying, uh, you know, the common network functions, or you know, in other words, uh, Envoy filters or gRPC middleware, we find that uh, it is not expressive, expressive enough uh, for some of the common network functions. So the idea we're currently pursuing uh, is a match action-like paradigm, uh, which is very common in uh, both Envoy filters and gRPC middleware that we surveyed. And the reason is uh, you. In most cases, you want to perform some action like dropping a, a RPC based on either a message header or some kind of internal states. But we will need a richer and extensible matches and actions that, uh, that are defined in languages like P4. So given the program abstraction, uh, we need to need a way to generate uh, an optimized implementation of it uh, 
onto different platforms. So we introduce uh, an IR in element level uh, to bridge the high level syntax and the low level code. And we also use the element IR to infer element properties like what field has been touched or uh, is it going to drop uh, packets, uh, drop RPCs. So there's also a graph IR uh, that enables cross element optimizations. Like, you, uh, like uh, I showed you earlier, uh, we can reorder elements uh, for uh, efficiency reasons. And we also need, uh, gonna use the element, uh, sorry, gonna use the uh, graph IR to reason about uh, graph equivalence, uh, which is essential for uh, co correctness <laughs> of the program. And uh, going back to the example I showed you earlier, uh, we can define this fault injection module uh, you, based on this uh, language. So we match on some expression, and based on the result, we either drop the RPC or forward it. And in terms of the graph IR, uh, it is essentially a graph of nodes with some annotations uh, for things like what field is uh, touched, like write or read, uh, or is it going to drop RPCs? So putting it all together, um, the overall ADN architecture looks like this. Developer write ADN programs with fits in uh, to the control plane, which consists of a compiler and a controller. So the compiler's job is to generate, again, generate uh, efficient and optimized uh, implementations of the program onto different target uh, processors. And the controller's job is to interact with a cluster co controller like the Kubernetes controller uh, to know the, like the service location, the network topology, and the health of those processors. So which then uh, deploy the generated code uh, onto different processors. And it also is a feedback loop uh, which the processor reports is uh, like resource usage uh, back to the controller. And with that, I will conclude my talk and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks for listening. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's really good. I really love this vision. I have one question. Let's say that I'm trying to deploy an application and I grab microservices from different sources, sources a, a database from here, and uh, login service from over there. How do you envision, wh who is this responsibility to make this whole thing work? Because it's likely that s some of these components don't know anything about this. So is the person building the application itself and connecting the components that adds all these configurations? And is there any compatibility issues for widespread adoption? Yeah, so I think we imagine uh, the application when you, you're building it knows uh, what kind of like processing needs to happen uh, when you exchange messages. But let's say I think uh, what artists might do is to have uh, like a separate team that uh, controls those uh, processing. So that will uh, know like uh, have better knowledge of the underlying network topology to know uh, what kind of process is needed uh, for each edge. Really good talk. Um, my question is that, as we heard the, earlier this morning, networks themselves are also changing. So you're not doing this really in a vacuum, right? Like you're doing this in an, an environment where your underlying platform is also changing at the same time. So how do you know that what you're building is actually future-proof? And these abstractions are what's right for what is to come? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, first off, we make the assumption that uh, you have the total control of the underlying network, so you can uh, change the underlying protocols that uh, used to exchange RPCs. Uh, so going back to the question, um, I don't have a good answer uh, on top of my head, but um, I can, can check that a little bit. I, I think the worldview here is that you have a, that the cloud has provided a virtual layer two, and on top of that, we control everything. So you have this virtual layer two abstraction that you know Microsoft or AWS or uh, Google have provided, and this is essentially software-based infra running on top. 
So I think we will add essentially headers we need on top of that. So just take that. So I think so creating that virtual network is like the cloud provider's problem and everything else on top is run via this what infrastructure. Kind of uh, we just need the virtual layer two contract, um, <laughs> which, uh, which basically VPCs or something like that, yeah. I think that's the other thing that I might say like um, in that direction. I think there's a lot of evidence from the database community that speaking in a in a declarative language provides you a huge amount of leverage towards adapting to changes in the underlying hardware platform. And I think your talk was basically in that direction. And so if you're talking about future proofing relative to hardware evolution, I think mm -hmm. deciding that you're going to operate at a, at a more declarative language is going to be much more powerful over time than trying to try to map onto some specific characteristic of a particular NIC that you might have in your lab. Sure. Um, I don't know if we have time for one more. Sure, one last Dave. This might be a question of philosophy more than anything else, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, if you zoom way out, it feels like in both the sidecar model and your model here, you're still putting components on path between the communicating business logic. Right. And I guess are you saying that that model, the sidecar philosophy of sticking things on path is wrong? Or are you saying, I have a much better flexible principled way of sticking things on path between the communicating modules? <laughs> Uh, I think the short answer is the latter. Uh, you know, uh, it has to be on pause because you need the processing anyways, right? Uh, for for it to to work. So uh, I'm just arguing for uh, sidecars that has tried to build uh, sidecars on the general layered approach is wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think the large part of the reason for sidecars was that you're you're you know one of the tasks of application programming now is taking large chunks of code that somebody else wrote. And trying to manage it, right? I, you know, like I need this thing that somebody else did because I don't want to have to do it myself, and I need to somehow get that to be usable within the context of whatever the rest of my application is. And if you take that as your fundamental, like, oh, that has to be something you solve, then a bunch of this stuff ends up sort of driving from there. All right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. So next we have Sam Kumar, who's a postdoc here, um, and he's going to tell us what he's been thinking about hardware acceleration. All right. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. As you said, I'm Sam, and I'm going to tell you about an early project we have in the works, or I should say an early agenda we have in the works on how we can use SmartTix to accelerate RPCs. This is an early project, so I don't have any data or even a concrete system design, but we would like your feedback on the overall idea here and the approach that we're taking. So just to do a quick recap of a relevant aspect of ADN, you know, one aspect of ADN is that you have these network elements that are being processed, um, uh, they're basically stages in processing an RPC, and you have the physical topology, uh, basically the places where you can execute this, and you know, one thing that application-defined networking does is it assigns these network elements to, uh, to the particular locations in the topology. So I guess this, this didn't quite show up right here, but the, but the point is that things like load balancing may happen in the RPC library, logging may happen in the sidecar, uh, and so on. Uh, now, where do smart things fit into this? You know, how ADN can use smart things is one of the central questions we would like to ask here. And just to do a quick recap, I know in this audience, many of you are probably very familiar with SmartNix, but I thought I would do a brief overview for those of us who aren't. So they're best, understand in con they're best understood in contrast to regular NIC. So in regular NIC, you have your host, you have your network interface card over a PCIe bus, and, that is how you and that's the peripheral through which you can access the actual network, like the physical Ethernet link, for example. In a SmartNIC, uh, it's essentially the same thing, except that you now have compute resources on the SmartNIC itself. For example, a CPU and its associated memory. And these aren't some theoretical thing. These are things you can actually buy on the market today. You know, they're commercial offerings by Mellanox and Marvel. You know, large-scale cloud providers use these in their infrastructure. And while here I have an example of a CPU, you know, in principle, you can have other kinds of resources too, like an FPGA or even specific network accelerators. So, you know, going back to this picture we had here, 
you know, how is it actually going to work? How can we use SmartNix in the context of ADN? Well, the most straightforward, the straw man approach is to just have your SmartNix uh, be one additional place in the physical topology. Where now you may choose to put, for example, compression or fault injection or one of these network elements on the SmartNIC as one additional option in your ADN pipeline. And this is perhaps the most obvious way you could use SmartNICs in the context of application networking or ADN, and it already brings some important benefits. And the most important one is the fact that we can now offload CPU cycles to the SmartNIC. The idea is that whereas before, you know, we have you know, our host CPUs and RAM and the SmartNIC, right, and we had to do all of our networking work previously on the host, we can offer the network processing to the SmartNIC, and as a result, we can use the CPU cycles we have on the host CPU for application logic, right? We have more CPU cycles for that. And, you know, this is a very common motivation for using SmartNICs uh, in the academic literature, right? If you look at a paper that came out of some of the folks here, Flexto, you know, the motivation was the communication terms of applications spend a huge amount of CPU cycles on TCP. So the solution is let's offload TCP to the NIC. Uh, we see this in other work too. For example, Clara states that SmartNIC offloading enables server CPUs to perform more application level work. And if you look at the Azure paper on ExcelNet, you know, one motivation for using SmartNICs was that even one physical core for host networking is quite expensive, right? And, you know, I want to just uh, acknowledge that this is a little bit different here. They're using an FPJ on the SmartNIC, but the motivation is still, you know, we want to use our host cores for application logic. Right? So, you know, it's very well accepted that, you know, CPU offload is an important motivation for SmartNICs, but in this talk, I'm actually going to present a somewhat contrarian view, which is that, you know, if you think about things in the long term, then maybe CPU offloading is not actually a very strong motivation for using SmartNICs. And to understand why, you know, that's the case, or why I'm going to present this opinion, you know, if you think about what offloading is doing, it's really just moving computation from one place to another, moving the computation from the host CPUs over to the smart NIC, right? And if you think about it as just moving computation, well, those extra CPUs need not actually even be at the NIC. You could do the same thing just with, your extra, with just getting extra CPUs on your host and just offloading your network processing to those extra CPUs. Right? In the short term, you know, obviously, if you already have a server and you already have a SmartNIC on it, of course you want to go and offload work on the SmartNIC. You would not want to keep that SmartNIC CPU idle. But in the long term, you know, if I have a choice between either investing in more cores at my SmartNIC or more cores at my host, it's actually unclear if, you know, if all I want to do is offload CPU cycles somewhere else, why I would ever want those extra CPUs of the NIC, because having it across the PCIe bus just makes it harder to manage and actually get real application gains from it. Now, just to be upfront about some assumptions I'm making here, you know, I'm not considering energy usage. You know, there are arguments out there that putting extra work on the smart NIC might be more energy efficient compared to the host. And I'm assuming that any compute resources you have at the smart NIC can actually be moved to the host. Like, for example, if you have a network accelerator at the smart NIC, you know, that you can move that to the host in the long term. Uh, or if you have an FPGA, the same applies. Uh, but the point is that, you know, just if you want to offload CPU cycles, you're really just treating your smart NIC as being, you know, a general purpose accelerator. And it's unclear, you know, whether in the long term that really is an argument for having these around, right? So to understand how we can actually use smart NICs in a way that's beneficial in the long term, we have to think about how is a smart NIC different from just another CPU? And if you think about it, right, what's actually different about these? What's different is the placement of these CPUs close to the network, right? The fact that I can get from the network to a CPU without having to actually traverse the PCIe bus, right? And in this project, we're looking at how we can benefit from smart NICs in a fundamental way what applications can benefit from the placement of compute close to the network, and in particular, how we can actually leverage this in the context of ADN. So how do smart NIC accelerators actually facilitate this? Are smart NICs designed under the hood in a way that allow applications to benefit from smart NICs in this way? And you know, from an ADN standpoint, how an ADN compiler or an ADN tool can automatically figure out how to integrate smart NICs in an appropriate way into the application to fully leverage them. So, you know, 
on first glance, it may seem a little bit tricky. How is the placement actually going to help us? So let me talk about a few different ways in which the placement of computation close to the network might be able to benefit application performance. Right, so the first benefit is that we can potentially eliminate PCIe latency. Imagine we're running an RPC server on this machine. And the way a regular RPC would work is that, you know, your request comes in from the client, it goes to the NIC all the way to the host, CPUs and RAM. You go computer response, the response goes all the way back. But one opportunity we see with smart NICs to leverage the fact that we have computation in the smart NIC is that we can offload our server to the smart NIC itself. So now we can get the request and response and get through all of that without ever having to cross the PCIe bus even once. So we can potentially reduce latency. And the eliminating the bus latency can be potentially really relevant if, for example, you have an RPC between two machines in the same rack where the PCIe hop may have a comparable latency to the actual interconnect between the two machines on the rack. Right, so what applications can benefit from this? Well, you know, on the one hand, you have some applications that, ca that can be fully offloaded, right? Where you can have a situation where no requests require host resources. You know, these are things like network functions, like, like NAT, IPsec, and so on, or even some simple machine learning or database workloads that can fit entirely within limited CPUs and memory available on the smart NIC. On the other hand, you know, we have the other extreme where, you know, you can't do, do any meaningful offload. You know, maybe you can put one stage of your network processing on the smart NIC, but every request has to hit your host, right? These are things like maybe GPU-based machine learning workloads where I need access to the GPU or some other resource on the host outside of the smart NIC. Or it could be, you know, if you're just doing something like a classical ADN paradigm where you're going and offloading one stage in your network processing off to the smart NIC. But the point I want to make here is that there's actually a happy middle as well, where you, know, you can be in a situation where some requests require host resources and others don't. For example, if you have a large key value store that doesn't entirely fit in your smart NIC, but I can try and move my hot key value pairs to the smart NIC to improve the latency for accessing uh, those values. So my point here is it's not really an all or nothing thing. There's actually a continuum here. And what's particularly interesting is if you look at the applications that benefit from offloading in some way, What's clear is that all of these are going to require the application logic to run on the smart NIC, right? Where it's not just a matter of, you know, running network processing. You have to run some application code on the smart NIC as well. It raises its own questions about how you might integrate applications that extend the processor container model to include resources on the smart NIC too. There's another benefit you can get, and that has to do with reducing the PCIe bandwidth usage. Right, so one idea is maybe even if all my requests have to go and hit the host for some reason, right, I can do some kind of pre-processing and post-processing at the smart NIC to reduce how much I have to communicate with the host. So maybe I get a big request in for the network onto the smart NIC, but I send only a small fraction of that to the server. And from that small portion of the request, the server can generate some compressed version of the response that then gets decompressed on the smart NIC. So that way, even though you know, the client sees the full request and response as it should, you know, the server, basically, the host only has to see a small portion of that. And you can potentially save on you know, bus traffic as well as cache pollution, right? I don't have to use as much of my server cache on these huge RPCs. I can maybe only have a small portion of it there, and that might improve performance. So what application might benefit in this way? Well, one example is middle boxes, right? For example, if I have a NAT, you know, we get an incoming packet that has a source destination IP address and port, right? This packet goes to the smart NIC. The smart NIC forwards only the IP addresses and ports to the host CPU, right? It computes the new IP addresses and ports, sends it back, and then the smart NIC puts that into the packet and then sends it back out. That's an example of one way you can reduce the bandwidth send on the PCIe bus. And this would also be another avenue where we can leverage the placement of computation at the NIC to improve application performance. So in conclusion, you know, what we're looking at here is that to fully leverage smart NICs, we should be placing application code, not just network stack code at the smart NIC. And this raises important directions for future work, including how you might extend the microservices or container model to include the smart NIC resources as well, and how you might use ADN to potentially automate integrating smart NICs into applications. That's all I have prepared, and I'm happy to take questions now. I guess my 
vague recollection is that one of the origins of SmartNix was because it was so expensive to interrupt one of these really special cores, you know, that we, that we put on the CPU that was very uh, you know, you know, smart about scheduling, uh, you know, doing deep pipelines and so on. So we could put dumber cores on the SmartNIC. And I think your idea is, well, if what you just need is some dumber cores, we can put efficiency cores back on the, on the main GPU. So I guess, uh, on the, on the, on the, in, in back in the host. So I guess my question, kind of looking at these last couple of slides, is if the scarce resource is the PCIe bus, is that really a scarce resource? I mean, it's, you're, you're, it's much wider than the Ethernet, right? Yeah, so, so I mean, that's a fair point. You know, what I'm doing here is I'm listing ways in which we can potentially use the, the resources on the SmartNIC to, you know, save basically use the placement of the CPU or, or computation of the SmartNIC in some way. You know, as I said, this is still a very, very early stage, and when we do experiments, we find out that that's exactly right, that the second benefit doesn't actually benefit applications in practice. It's merely an idea for how we might leverage computation of the SmartNIC, right? To give some more perspective on what I'm doing here, right? If you really believe that, you know, any computation resources of the SmartNIC can be moved to the host, the question is, what are SmartNICs really good for? And what I'm presenting here is, you know, in the best case, right, assuming everything works out in terms of actually getting performance, how might that manifest? And then the next step is to actually go run experiments, see whether any of these actually improve performance in practice. But I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. I think, I guess what I'm saying is, it might be that, Sam, at the beginning of the talk, when you made your thesis that, why do we even have SmartNICs? It would be an interesting result if you got to the end of your experiments and said, we, do, we don't. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And, you know, our methodology here is, let's see, let, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, what, where would we see better gains if we could get them? And we'll see if they actually turn up. But that's exactly right, yeah. Hi, so I have a question regarding the... Uh, uh, the argument you said. So one of the things I'm wondering, I think more uh, like the heavyweight part is the RPC part. I believe everything um, you just said is, uh, um, can be viewed in another angle that if you want, if you can offload it to SmartNIC and due to the limitation of the SmartNIC, so actually the protocol stack, pro, uh, pro, uh, protocol stack is actually simpler. Right? If you consider using RPC on end host, then you are going to go through TCP, go through uh, kernel stack, et cetera, et cetera, and you're not, not going to uh, waste time on any of them on the SmartNIC. So it's not only because PCI latency is quite really, really small recently, it's like nanosecond, nanosecond level, right? So I think, I, I think the, all the benefits you're going to, you're going to get is uh, because of the simplified architecture on the proto stack and on the SmartNIC. And I then, then the problem, I think, lies in the RPC stack, right? that if you probably have a UDP-based uh, UDP uh, uh, RPC stack, and uh, maybe it's a more simplified, um, let's say, uh, operating system that can be run on CPU, then I definitely believe the performance is going to be better, and throughput is going to be better, latency is going to be better on the CPU rather than the SmartNIC. And actually, that probably lies to the question to uh, the AD, all, all the ADN architecture. That probably maybe we can need a, we need a more like a uh, ADN based operating system, right? In the in the sense that in the like we can cut a cut a whole core that is isolated from the Linux kernel, and then they can directly talk, directly talk to the NIC, had had a really high uh, um, uh, really low kernel overhead and really high like uh, core frequency and the performance is going to be better than the SmartNIC. I'm wondering whether this design is better than, like what, what your comparison against uh, both of them? Yeah, so, uh, so thanks for, for sharing your thoughts there. And I mean, it's an interesting idea that we may see gains in the SmartNIC because we simplify the protocol stack in that setting. One thing I would like to say though, is there's no reason why the SmartNIC and a simpler protocol stack necessarily have to be coupled with each other. Right, if I was okay, for example, just using UDP or with some kind of simplified RPC processing, I might as well just use a UDP or simplified RPC processing on my host cores and just benefit from the faster processing I have there, right? So, you know, once again, you know, I really think it's a question here that we're, that we're trying to investigate. You know, what are SmartNICs really useful for? And, you know, as others have pointed out, if the conclusion of this ends up being there isn't really a compelling application that benefits substantially from SmartNICs, that's actually a very important conclusion in its own right. Um, just one question. I was curious if you thought about what kind of environment you would need on the SmartNIC to manage the applications that, the thousand applications that now want, I mean, obviously it's an interesting thing to think about and to try, but you know, we're gonna have 
500 cores, 1,000 cores on the main CPU, whatever it is, and a lot of applications are going to want to offload or at least try it. How do you manage that environment? Uh, it is, some, at least today, somewhat resource constra constrained. Um, it's not infinite. And there are probably security issues and things like this as well. So yeah. just wonder, wondering about the environment. Is, so you're raising an important set of questions about you know, how we might extend like a process or container abstraction onto the smart thing with appropriate levels of isolation. You know, one natural way to do it might be something of the sort where you know, to manage cores, you just partition the cores uh, statically, similar to like how you might, similar to how containers often work, right? Where you just assign some number of cores to each container. Uh, memory is going to be a more challenging one, and you know, a natural question is whether you know if you have multiple applications that want to cache data on, on the smart NIC, whether you might have some kind of unified buffer cache similar to what you see in an operating system. You know, it's the case. You know, I, I've done a bit of thinking about it, and I think that what's uh, what's ultimately going to end up happening is that there's some extension of your OS kernel running on the smart NIC, which is actually not too far fetched to what Smart is capable of today with these cores of the smart NICs often running full-fledged kernels like Linux or something like that anyway. Um, so, so, so that's my preliminary thought, that you're gonna need some kind of extension of the kernel to the smart NICs and you know, the smart NICs today are often pretty capable of that already. This is kind of in the same, same vein. Uh, you know, one, I think your observation that just shifting cycles, not all that interesting, I think that's right. Uh, one of the big benefits you get in a multi-tenant environment by moving things off the host onto the smart NIC is performance consistency. And, but if you start uploading lots of ADNs, you've kind of, have you reintroduced that problem and how do you design, how do you either restrict the ADNs how do you, or how do you design the environment on the smart NICs to, if you still care about performance consistency? Yeah, so, so I think that's a great question. Um, you know, the performance consistency you get from smart NICs, I mean, I think one of the interesting things to explore is exactly what the origin of that is. You know, if you're getting performance consistency because you have some dedicated core now that's not doing IO or interrupts or anything else, it's just for the application, you could in principle get that as well just by having the process of those extra cores alongside your host cores, not necessarily across from the NIC. Now, if it arises from the bus or something of that sort, Right then, you know, maybe you do, you don't need to have your cores over there. Now, the point you're making about you know having many ADNs all competing for the smart NIC now potentially could be solved if you have a large number of cores at the smart NIC and you want to try and it gives you some ability to assign cores statically to these different applications. Um, but you know that said, you know if, if really what the thing is is you know you need to have access to your own core, you don't really have enough cores that that may end up being a limitation of smart NICs as well, right? That, that really there's no way out if that's really what you need. Uh, you know, one, one other problem that, that's there is that, you know, these smart NICs tend to have less sophisticated memory hierarchies or at least less performant ones than what you see at the host. So if your caches are all smaller, right, that makes, you know, CPU sharing even worse if you, what you want is really consistent performance. You know, the case where you can get consistent performance is also really limited to the case where you have like some kind of microservice that you can offload totally to the smart NIC, right? If you have something where, you know, the whole memory doesn't fit, I can only offload my hotkey value pairs or something, the worst case is still going to be you have to go to the host. In fact, it's going to be slightly worse because you checked on the smart NIC first. Uh, so, I mean, I think the cases where you can get really limited, where you can get good tail latency are limited to the ones where you can offload completely and even then, you know, you may need a large number of cores where you can allocate whole cores in order to even see those benefits. So it's something you'll have to investigate and see what happens. Thanks. What's the difference between the smart NIC and the main core? Anyhow, I mean, don't you just eventually get to the point that, yeah, it's just a general purpose processor. It's yeah, a general so, purpose node. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the way where it would be different is, you know, if locating the core on the other side of the PCIe bus, where it's just like in the NIC itself, Right, helps to give you more deterministic latency because they don't have to contend with other, uh, with other peripherals using the bus, right? Then that may be an argument for using smart NICs because the placement of cores at the NIC is what's helping me get the deterministic performance. You know, at the end of the day, you know, smart NICs are only fundamentally useful in my opinion if you can leverage the placement of computation at the NIC in some way. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Um, last talk in this session before we break for lunch is Kevin Zhao. He's going to talk about uh, how do we provide SLAs for application networks over shared infrastructure. Thank you, Ritul. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, as he said, I'm Kevin. I'm a PhD student here in the Systems Lab, and I have the um, great pleasure of working on the topic you see here. I'm with my advisor, Tom, and some others in this room, and also um, with uh, collaborators at uh, Microsoft and MIT. Um, okay, so um, at the very beginning of this session, Shang Feng gave you a vision wherein you specify the functional requirements of what you think your network should do, and we automatically are going to synthesize implementations that um, <coughs> satisfy that specification in an efficient performant manner. And then Sam got up here and gave a compelling case for how you might think about using uh, smart NICs efficiently. And these approaches are very, very promising and interesting, but there is a concern that on their own they don't yet address, um, which is um, how do you get performance guarantees, this question of like performance consistency and stuff like that. So let's say I've got a service, you know, and I really need it to finish within, you know, X milliseconds or my customers are going to start running to the nearest competitor. Um, that's a business requirement, and I might have many kinds of these business requirements. Um, so it's common to divide, you know, what we'll commonly see is we'll divide traffic into, um, into different, uh, you know, classes of business priorities, um, like so. And um, each one might have an SLO, which is just um, some predicate over some measurable indicator um, or metric that has the property that if, you know, this SLO is satisfied, then my performance is deemed acceptable. Okay. Um, in this example, there are four priority classes, um, and the priorities sort of like get less and less strict as you go down. I've written them in terms of like tail latency priorities, which tend to be important for predictable performance and are difficult notoriously to satisfy. And I'll have a priority four that's just like a flex, you know, sort of like best effort priority. So the question is, how do I ensure that um, these SLOs are a stable guarantee um, as best I can come what may? And importantly, not just that, how do I get these SLOs efficiently? Right, without just provisioning more and more resources um, and running the whole network at low utilization. Okay, so I'm going to frame this. Um, let's take a look. I'm going to um, at you know current methods for controlling performance and efficiency in the network, and I'm going to frame this in terms of um, time scales of overload, just as a way of thinking about it. On short time scales we have um, congestion control. And on long time scales overload, we commonly see some things like admission control. Now, there are other strategies, but these two are um, widely used and important. I think it's safe to say that you'll find them just about anywhere, like what we do today. Okay. So first, the venerable congestion control. Um, the top level goal here is to minimize queuing delay while maximizing link utilization. So over the years, there have been many, many um, proposals um, for doing stuff like this, um, each occupying sort of a different point in the Pareto frontier of queuing delay versus link utilization. Um, you know, some will push the Pareto frontier outward with new algorithms or hardware support, but the top level goal is usually the same, which is, you know, keep queues short, keep links utilized. Okay, this is very, very useful, but it, here's the thing, it's not really designed to provide performance guarantees. You know, because um, congestion control works flow by flow, a noisy application, for instance, can just consume more network and interfere with everyone else just by spawning more flows, for instance. But there's another issue that's fundamental to end-to-end -end congestion control, which I will explain. End-to-end -end congestion control works at the level of individual flows. Um, how it works is that a flow is going to arrive, it's going to send its packets into the network, that packet is going to collect congestion information at every hop along the trip to its destination, which will then be echoed back to the source, and only then will the sending flow be able to adjust its rate based on the congestion uh, signals. So we could send an entire BDP at line rate without any control. And if a flow is smaller than a BDP, it will never be controlled. So how big of a problem is this? Well, uh, here's a graph from our recent work on BFC. Each line, um, each, uh, line is the cumulative bytes contributed by flows up to a certain size for a particular workload. And so there's a lot here, but it answers the question, what percentage of bytes are contributed by flows less than a certain size? 
Okay? The vertical lines show the BDP for three different link speeds. Here's the takeaway. Look at the green line and look at the third vertical line, which is 100 gigabit per second. Half of all bytes from flows are smaller than a BDP. That means that half of all data will be untouched by congestion control. And what's worse, the faster and faster link speeds get, and the smaller and smaller RPCs get, the more and more traffic will be uncontrolled. So here's the deal. It's hard to even design end-to-end -end congestion control with performance guarantees, especially as link speeds get faster with congestion control, because you're pretty much at the mercy of uncontrolled traffic and the limit, up to half, maybe more. So we need methods that aren't just reactive at the level of individual flows. So the next thing, on long time scales, congestion control was about short time scale overload. What about long time scale overload? For instance, what if utilization is too high or your SLOs are so demanding at that moment that there's no setting in the network that could possibly sustain your performance requirements? In that case, you have to do admission control. You have to reject traffic, okay? Um, um, Aquitus is an example of a system that does this. Um, each business priority is um, associated with a, a weighted fair queuing weight at the switch. And um, when we notice that SLOs can't be met, basically we will downgrade traffic to best effort of SLOs um, in, order to, in order to satisfy our SLO bounds, basically. So admission control can provide guarantees, but it has the property that the guarantees are only provided for admitted traffic. So you could wind up in a situation where you have traffic that has been marked by a developer as performance critical, but gets no guarantees because the network was overloaded at that time. Um, which is, you know, this is a really reasonable thing to do. It's a lot better than nobody in the performance critical traffic class getting their SLO, but somewhat as, um, unsatisfying, especially if there was a setting in the network that could have admitted that traffic and also met its SLO. Remember, these, these RPCs were performance critical, okay? So um, that's where we are. Uh, let me be clear about what I'm not saying. I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm not saying that you know, we should replace them with something. There's a real sense in which we have to do these things on multiple timescales. Um, without congestion control, queues get you know, huge and packets get dropped and the system is unavailable. And without admission control, the system upon you know, long -term, some long-term mismatch between what's being offered and what can be supported, um, will also, you know, the system may also become unavailable. So, um, but there's a potentially a new opportunity here on medium time scales that can drive efficiency. So the ADN world where RPC networks are specialized and specified for individual applications gives us potentially a lot of visibility into requirements, goals, and characteristics, which can enable good feedback control in the network on medium time scales. So for now, I'll just call this network control. In broad terms, instead of um, relying on admission control as sort of a first responder. It's just a heavy-handed reject traffic. You don't get, you know, you don't get priority. Um, um, can we instead use the parameters in the network um, to drive it into states that can meet SLOs before we apply rejection? Um, okay, so that's what network-wide control is about. If we can take advantage of application visibility and closely monitor workloads and performance, and, and we might be able to adjust parameters to meet SLOs like switch weights, rate limits, CC parameters, and you know, switch buffer allocation. And this could give us the ability to achieve SLOs while driving higher efficiency and lowering costs, which is great for everybody. Um, there are many, many challenges, but a couple of main ones um, is that the first is that things are changing everywhere all the time. Workloads are non-stationary, they're bursty, you might have you know, things like in-cast and, and lots of other nasty things. And um, the, no the, no the other one, which is a big one, is that we cannot control what we cannot model. Okay? I need to know if I tune this you know, performance knob, this switch weight, in this direction, the performance of the traffic is going to change like this. Okay. Systems in the real world obey natural laws. You can write down differential equations that describe what they do and you know, imp implement closed loop control feedback on top of that. But this is not so in computing. And so um, in order to be able to do something like this, um, we envision an architecture for guaranteeing tail latency as having four parts. We need to be able to measure both the workloads and their performance. We need to know what their goals are. And if we can't measure, then we can't model and we can't close the loop and ADN could help us here. So for every knob we want to turn, we also need to be able to model its effects. 
Once we have a model, we can use it for feedback control. And because um, there are no guarantees for applications that can exhibit arbitrary bad behavior, we need some form of enforcement, perhaps like Aquitus, but there's a very, very big space there. So I'm going to very, very briefly um, describe some of our efforts on modeling and control. Um, our paper in this year's NSDI was about, can we get a really fast simulated model to answer this question? You know, how does network tail latency respond to changes in configuration? Um, how does, well, no, no, what if workloads evolve? What if links fail? And our goal was to quickly estimate the tail of flow completion times. Um, and as it turns out, we were able to get to within 10% accuracy at the P99 up to 500 times faster on a single machine when compared to NS3, which is a standardly used discrete event simulator today. Um, the um, top level sort of insight was if we could somehow consider the effect of each link independently, it would potentially get massively parallel simulation. Uh, this is an approximation, um, <clears throat> which necess necessarily will cause us to lose some accuracy, but the question was could we do this and get good answers? Um, and so our approach in broad strokes was to decompose the network into individual link simulations. Um, um, we asked the question, you know, for each link, how much delay does the congestion at that link contribute to end-to-end -to -end, end -to -end delays? Um, and then we can, you know, after we do this, after we have a bunch of independent link simulations, we can cluster similar ones together and we can prune them. For each link, we, can, we generate a topology that tries to isolate the effect of congestion at that link. And we simulate all these in parallel and we combine them with Monte Carlo sampling. Okay, and so um, here's the tail FCT slowdown, flow completion time slowdown for our simulator, which we call Parsimon, and NS3 uh, binned by flow size on a network with thousands of hosts. So the slowdown is the, um, or I'm going to define slowdown real quick. It's the observed, um, it's the observed flow completion time relative to the ideal flow completion time on an unloaded network. And Parsimon estimates a tight estimate across all percentiles. But while NS3 took 11 hours to produce these results, Parsimon took 80 seconds. I should mention we also have ongoing efforts currently to further accelerate these kinds of predictions using uh, machine learning techniques. Um, okay. Lastly, a very, very quick case study on control. It's not complete, but let's just see what we can do. So the question is, can we adjust switch weights at the switch to meet SLOs? You know, I've just described um, Parsimon, but, and we have plans for that, but let's start with much, something much simpler, just like simple linear models. I'm gonna, um, we hypothesize that like, even simple linear models can drive effective control decision. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna approximate that the performance of a traffic class is a function only of its weight allocation. And the question is, while simplistic, can we use this to build an effective controller? So I'm going to put three equations up here, and I'm going to follow that by some vigorous hand-waving in the interest of time. Um, so we're going to borrow a framework due to Filieri and Hoffman and Maggio for, um, for synthesizing a, 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 a single link control, uh, for uh, synthesizing a single input, single output controller. Um, basically, the performance of my system is going to depend on the amount of weight that I'm allocating to it. And it's going to be a linear function of that and I have some way of measuring the error between the performance that I'm at and the performance that I want. And then on each time step, I'm going to adjust, um, I'm going to adjust my switch allocation, which you know, uh, follows this equation that details aren't very important, but it's, it, you know, it follows pretty naturally and, there's a good, um, and, and this controller can provide some nice guarantees. Okay, and so this term here, this dx term, essentially what I'm going to use it for is I'm going to use it to tell me at each time step how much should I adjust my switch weight up and down in order to get closer to my desired SLO level. I could be above it, I could be under it. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, you know, with multiple classes, I'm going to shift resource allocations from SLO compliant ones to SLO non-compliant ones. Okay. Um, and so there's no reason why, you know, something like this would work. Because like I said before, it, is, it assumes a lot. It assumes that changing one class's weight only affects that class, which is obviously not true in the general case. However, and perhaps surprisingly, you know, on single link simulations, this thing will actually converge. So this is a single link simulation at NS3. X is the time step. Uh, um, um, and the left graph shows performance, and the right graph shows um, the switch weight that the controller determines, pretend that it's normalized to zero to one. And to start, you know, all classes have the same traffic. At T equals 40, class B, you know, triples its sending rate. And then at T equals 70, um, class B goes back to normal, but class C, you know, becomes a lot burstier. It's like, can we adapt to changing circumstances? And as it turns out, using just a very simple scheme, we can. Um, 
So there's a lot more to do here. I'm going to conclude. Um, Application-defined networks um, provide an opportunity, you know, with visibility to meet SLOs while driving higher efficiency and lowering costs. And even simple models and controllers have shown the uh, potential to perform well, which is very, very interesting and potentially exciting because we love, you know, simple things. Um, uh, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the talk. Um, in full disclosure, this is somewhat in relation to some work that I've done in the past as well, which is um, when you do this type of thing, you also need to account for the fa uh, mitigation decisions that operators are going to make when failures are happening, right? And sometimes, might, for example, it might be beneficial to keep um, links that are dropping packets in place to make sure that you have capacity to support your ongoing traffic, right? So how are you thinking about those types of things? How are you thinking about the interaction with the, the decisions that operators are going to make when failures are going to happen? Yeah, so that's a good question, and it's, a, it's an important thing to consider. I guess in my mind, the way that I conceptualize, you know, this, like, control problem is just, like, can we drive the network into a state that meets SLOs? And, and, it, and it might be the case that you actually can't, which is, like, sort of, like, where this, like, long time scale mitigations come in. Like, we got to have mechanisms for enforcing that, you know, if, uh, if like, uh, incoming traffic is like out of spec or misbehaving or something like that, um, that uh, we apply, you know, like admission control or throttling there. And uh, that's an interesting area. Um, I don't know. That be a confounder for you, as in, are you assuming that you can see those changes or are you assuming that you're blind towards them? Um, which changes? Like basically the mitigation that's being applied to the network. Like what level of observability do you think you will have? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I guess I could um, I try to speculate, but I, that's, a, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting yeah, topic. Ben, I think two points to be made about it. I think from the operator side, you're needing to also, if you're going to be trying to meet SLOs, the, one of the consequences is you want to be able to meet those SLOs despite that there might be failures, which means you need to be able to ask the question, not just what is happening in your network right now, but what is likely to happen if some link goes out or if some switch fails. And which means you need to be able to answer the question, counterfactual questions quickly, which is part of the goal of Parsimon and the later work to try to drive sort of prediction-based control. Like, oh, I expect to see this, and, and so therefore that's what I should be doing. Now, the other part of your question is, is, okay, the operators are doing things for you. I think that has to be visible. Like, we're sort of operating in the sort of assumption of the sort of cloud space where you have control over the entire you have some control or visibility of the entire system certainly ADN gives you this notion that you're you're having some visibility over over the traffic and also potentially over what the underlying network is doing right I think that estimation point is actually very valid because that's part of the work that we also did which was try to figure out what is the estimate of how much risk you're going to experience right, when right, these right, types right. of things happen and otherwise you have no your your operating blind it's, it's really great. hi this is Daniel from Microsoft after I've been asked from Microsoft um, really interesting I, I liked how you had the different time scales on congestion control and reacting but somehow the left was missing. What about shorter time scales? I, I think you made a point that we're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I think we could make cases that this is even crazier than you think. Is, is the answer to that predictions? Or like, I feel like you, you filled out the middle, but what about the left? <laughs> yeah, so on the shorter time scales, I mean, there are people in this audience who have uh, worked on um, 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 uh, congestion control techniques that may be resilient to um, the phenomenon that I described, where links are getting faster and uh, and traffic is getting shorter, uh, the back, back, back pressure flow control. Um. Yeah, so some of, the, some of the work that we had done prior to this um, had been in trying to push some of those time scales to be a lot shorter. Uh, I mean, I think part of the challenge there is you need to be able to have the ability to control what switches do and either make them programmable, which is sort of questionable these days, or influence Broadcom, which of course will be one of the partners in a couple weeks. So hopefully there'll be interest in that direction as well. Lunch. Okay. <laughs>